All right, friends, let's pick up where we left off in Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. Chapter 20, The Hour of Triumph, page 155 in my copy. Special announcement, said the loudspeaker in a pompous voice. The management of the fair takes great pleasure in presenting Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman and his famous pig. The truck bearing this extraordinary animal is now approaching the infield. Kindly stand back and give the truck room to proceed. In a few moments, the pig will be unloaded in the special judging ring in front of the grandstand where a special award will be made. Will the crowd please make way and let the truck pass? Thank you. Wilbur trembled when he heard this speech. He felt happy but dizzy. The truck, truck crept along slowly in low speed. Crowds of people surrounded it, and Mr. Arable had to drive very carefully in order not to run over anybody. At last, he managed to reach the judge's stand. Avery jumped out and lowered the tailgate. I'm scared to death, whispered Mrs. Zuckerman. Hundreds of people are looking at us. Cheer up, replied Mrs. Arable. This is fun. Unload your pig, please, said the loudspeaker. All together now, boys, said Mr. Zuckerman. Several men stepped forward from the crowd to help lift the crate. Avery was the busiest helper of all. Tuck your shirt in, Avery, cried Mrs. Zuckerman, and tighten your belt. Your pants are coming down. Can't you see I'm busy, replied Avery in disgust. Look, cried Fern, pointing. There's Henry. Don't shout, Fern, said her mother, and don't point. Can I please have some money? asked Fern. Henry invited me to go to the Ferris wheel again, only I don't think he has any money left. He ran out of money. Mrs. Arable opened her handbag. Here, she said. Here's 40 cents. Now, don't get lost and be back at our regular meeting place by the pigeon pig pen very soon. Fern raced off, ducking and dodging through the crowd in search of Henry. The Zuckerman pig is now being taken from his crate, boomed the voice of the loudspeaker. Stand by for an announcement. Templeton crouched under the straw at the bottom of the crate. What a lot of nonsense, muttered the rat. What a lot of fuss about nothing. Over in the pig pen, silent and alone, Charlotte rested. Her two front legs embraced the egg sack. Charlotte could hear everything that was said on the loudspeaker. The words gave her courage. This was her hour of triumph. As Wilbur came out of the crate, the cl crowd clapped and cheered. Mr. Zuckerman took off his cap and bowed. Larvy pulled his big handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the sweat from the back of his neck. Avery knelt in the dirt by Wilbur's side, busily stroking him and showing off. Mrs. Zuckerman and Mrs. Arable stood on the running board of the truck. Ladies and gentlemen, said the loudspeaker, we now present Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman's distinguished pig. The fame of this unique animal has spread to the far corners of the earth attracting many valuable tourists to our great state. Many of you will recall the never-to-be-forgotten day last summer when the writing appeared mysteriously on the spider's web in Mr. Zuckerman's barn, calling the attention of, of all and sundry to the fact that this pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has never been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Zuckerman pig pen to study and observe the phenomenon. In the last analysis, we simply know that we are dealing with supernatural forces here, and we should all feel proud and grateful. In other words, in the words of the spider's web, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. <laughs> Wilbur blushed. He stood perfectly still and tried to look his best. This magnificent animal, continued the loudspeaker, is truly terrific. Look at him, ladies and gentlemen. Note the smoothness and whiteness of his coat. Observe the spotless skin and the healthy pink glow of ears and snout. It's the buttermilk, whispered Mrs. Arable to Mrs. Eckerman. Note the general radiance of this animal. Then remember the day when the word radiant appeared clearly on the web. Whence came this mysterious writing? Not from the spider. We can rest assured of that. Spiders are very clever at weaving their webs, but needless to say, spiders cannot write. Oh, they can't, can they? murmured Charlotte to herself. Ladies and gentlemen, continued the loudspeaker, I must not take any more of your valuable time. On behalf of the governors of the fair, 
I have the honor of awarding a special prize of $25 to Mr. Zuckerman, together with a handsome bronze medal suitably engraved, in token of our appreciation of the part played by this pig, this radiant, this terrific, this humble pig, in attracting so many visitors to our great county fair. Wilbur had been feeling dizzier and dizzier through this long complimentary speech. When he heard the crowd begin to cheer and clap again, he suddenly fainted away. His legs collapsed, collapsed, his mind went blank, and he fell to the ground unconscious. What's wrong? asked the loudspeaker. What's going on, Zuckerman? What's the trouble with your pig? Avery was kneeling by Wilbur's head, stroking him. Mr. Zuckerman was dancing about, fanning him with his cap. He's all right, cried Mr. Zuckerman. He gets these spells. He's modest and can't stand praise. Well, we can't give a prize to a dead pig, said the loudspeaker. It's never been done. He isn't dead, hollered Zuckerman. He's fainted. He gets embarrassed easily. Run for some water, Lurvy. Lurvy sprang from the judge's ring and disappeared. Templeton poked his head from the straw. He noticed that the end of Wilbur's tail was within reach. Templeton grinned. I'll tend to this, he chuckled. He took Wilbur's tail in his mouth and bit it just as hard as he could bite. The pain revived Wilbur. In a flash, he was back on his feet. Ouch, he screamed. Hooray, yelled the crowd. He's up. The pig's up. Good work, Zuckerman. That's some pig. Everyone was delighted. Mr. Zuckerman was the most pleased of all. He sighed with relief. Nobody had seen Templeton. The rat had done his work well. And now one of the judges climbed into the ring with prizes. He handed Mr. Zuckerman two $10 bills and a $5 bill. Then he tied the medal around Wilbur's neck. Then he shook hands with Mr. Zuckerman while Wilbur blushed. Avery put out his hand and the judge shook hands with him too. The crowd cheered. A photographer took Wilbur's picture. A great feeling of happiness swept over the Zuckermans and the Arables. This was the greatest moment in Mr. Zuckerman's life. It is deeply satisfying to win a prize in front of a lot of people. As Wilbur was being shoved back into the crate, Lurvy came charging through the crowd carrying a pail of water. His eyes had a wild look. Without hesitating a second, he dashed the water at Ilber. At Wilbur. In his excitement, he missed his aim, and the water splashed all over Mr. Zuckerman and Avery. They got soaking wet. For goodness sake, bellowed Mr. Zuckerman, who was really drenched. What ails you, Lurvy? Can't you see the pig is all right? You asked for water, said Lurvy meekly. I didn't ask for a shower bath, said Mr. Zuckerman. The crowd roared with laughter. Finally, Mr. Zuckerman had a laugh, too. And of course, Avery was tickled to find himself so wet, and he immediately started to act like a clown. He pretended he was taking a shower bath. He made faces and danced around and rubbed imaginary soap under his armpits. Then he dried himself with an imaginary towel. Avery, stop it, cried his mother. Stop showing off. But the crowd loved it. Avery heard nothing but the applause. He liked being a clown in a ring, with everybody watching in front of the grandstand. When he discovered there was still a little water left in the bottom of the pail, he raised the pail high in the air and dumped the water on himself and made faces. The children in the grandstand screamed with appreciation. At last, things calmed down. Wilbur was loaded into the truck. Avery was led from the ring by his mother and placed on the seat of the truck to dry off. The truck, driven by Mr. Arable, crawled slowly back to the pig pen. Avery's wet trousers made a big wet spot on the seat. Chapter 21 Last Day Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck. <clears throat> By looking out of the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem specially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. 
The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world, for you mean a great deal to Zuckerman, and he will not harm you, ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, the ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing, the frogs will awake, the warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy. Wilbur, this lovely world, these precious days. Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eyes. Oh, Charlotte, he said, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would, and I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back home in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a voice so low, Wilbur could barely hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even strength enough to climb down into the crate. I doubt if I'll have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in an agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs wrecked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned. Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, quiet, Wilbur. Stop thrashing about. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now. And they'll shove you into that crate and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced around and around the pen. Suddenly, he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 little spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his front feet up on the top board and gazed around. In the distance, he saw the Arables and the Zuckermans approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton, he demanded. He's in that corner, under the straw asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat, and tossed him into the air. Templeton screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed and then disgusted. What kind of monkey shine is this, he growled. Can't a rat catch a wink of sleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She has only a short time to live. She cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it and I can't climb. You are the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, please, Templeton, climb up and get the egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? 
Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. Hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began imitating Wilbur's voice. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? He said, ho, ho. And what thanks do I ever get for these services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton. Only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in des desperation, if you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost, and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the straw. Lazily, he placed his forepaws behind his head and crossed his knees in an attitude of complete relaxation. Die of a broken heart, he mimicked. How touching. My, my. I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble. But I've never heard anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh, no. Who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and lay still. Who made trip after trip to the dump, he asked. Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you had fainted in front of the crowd? Old Templeton, has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am, anyway? A rat of all work? Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming, and the rat was failing him. Suddenly, he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me, and from now on, I will let you eat first when Lurvy slops me. I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough, and I won't touch a thing until you're through. The rat sat up. You mean that, he said? I promise. I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had strength enough to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that fastened the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single of those eggs harmed. Fifth thuff thick in my mouth, complained the rat. It's worth than caramel candy. But Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as though I'd eaten a spoon spool of thread. Well, home we go. <clears throat> Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bundle in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit, and of course he couldn't say anything. But he was being shoved into the crate as he looked up at Charlotte, and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned all her strength and waved one of her front legs at him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart and the race horses were being loaded into the vans and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair 
knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. <clears throat> Tune into the next video for the conclusion of Charlotte's Web.